Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. And if you have a Bible or Bible device, go ahead and grab that. Romans chapter 1. We are beginning a brand new Bible study this evening. We're very, very excited. We are going to be looking at some other scriptures as we move forward. I'll call those out and we'll have some time to get to them. Romans chapter 1. Now, a couple of things before we get started. The book of Romans is unbelievably beautiful. It is a mind-blowing book. But you have to understand, there's a lot of very deep things going on in Romans. So these videos are probably going to be broken up in verse chunks instead of chapter chunks. The reason for that is there's a lot going on in just simple sections of, of, of verses. So we may you know, put out a video and only get through two verses because of the conversation that's going on. Because of that, these videos might be just a little bit shorter given that the material is, is a little bit deeper. So uh, uh, unlike the past videos where it's chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, these are gonna be broken up and there might be three or four videos for one specific chapter. You're noticing now that we are only going to be looking at the first seven verses here. And really that means we are only looking at Paul's greeting to the letter. And a couple of reasons for that. First of all, we're going to set up the context of this letter, the structure of this letter, what's going on historically in this letter. There's one specific thing in this letter that's very, very unique. Um, now, I'll be honest, honest with you, there are lots of things that are unique here, but there's one thing in particular about the audience that Paul's writing to uh, that is a little bit unique, unlike his other letters. So we need to talk about that. And so by the time we get into verse one, we will have already covered quite a bit of material. So that's the first reason. Second thing, there are several deep things that come up just in the introduction. So that's why we're only looking at the first seven, and then we'll look at another chunk uh, when it comes to next week. Next thing you need to know, we, for our online viewers, have now added something new. If you look in the description to this video, you're not only going to see my email address where you are absolutely free to ask any questions, and if I don't know the answer to them, I will find out and get back to you, but you're also going to see a link. That link is to a study guide based on the verses we just talked about. So because everything is so deep right now, um, I don't want you to feel like you have to just keep going back to the video over and over again. Now, you're welcome to do that. But if you click on that link in the description, you will get a study guide that will explain in written form basically everything that we just talked about. Now, I'm not going to read the study guide verbatim. I have the study guide in front of me now, and I'll bring some things off of it. But I wanted you to be able to have something you can refer to in print form and you can uh, print off and keep if you want. Every single video will have a study guide designated for that specific uh, part of scripture that we're studying, and um, it will also include any cross-references or background that we need. Now, some of these study guides may be long, some may be a little bit short. This one here for this particular week includes the structure of the book and the background, and that will not be included in the other study guides because once you see it once, we will refer back to it, but you won't need to see that in every single study guide. So from this point on, you will have a study guide for what we just went over, and it'll be available in the link in the description. Uh, and we're very excited about that. Feel free to print it off. Feel free to share it with others. Um, any uh, book that I reference, I will give credit towards, and uh, there'll be a citation in the bottom. Look at those citations. If that is a book you might be interested in buying, feel free to do that. I will tell you that I'm utilizing Grant Osborne's uh, New Testament commentary on Romans. It's absolutely excellent. I actually have it right here. Looks like this. You can get it on Amazon. It's amazing. Um, uh, Grant Osborne's a PhD in New Testament, and it is just brilliant. Uh, this is an excellent commentary, but a little word of warning. This is for uh, students getting their master's degrees, right? So I say that to say the lingo that's used in this might be a little bit deep. Uh, I'm not saying you can't handle it. I'm saying if you get it and uh, some of the lingo that he's using in the cross-references are a little bit shocking, it's because it's for master's students. Other thing too, just to tell you how deep the book of Romans really is, the book of Romans is 16 chapters long, right? Not very long in comparison to other books of the Bible. <clears throat> it's 16 chapters long. Look how thick this commentary is. Just on 16 chapters, you've got this thick of a commentary. So there's a lot going on, but this is a great resource. Again, you can look up all the info there. Absolutely excellent if you want a good commentary to go along with it. So 
what we will do here is we will pray, then we will talk about the background to this book, then we'll talk about how it's structured, then we'll talk about the nature of Paul's introductions to his letters, and then we will dive into uh, the first seven verses here. So let's pray. Father God, we come before you now. We are so thankful for your love and grace that we do not deserve, but you've delighted to give because you love us. And Father, as we dive into this new series, I pray that you really open our hearts and minds to understand the nature of not only ourselves, but the nature of the gospel, Lord, the incredible, the incredible beauty behind you sending your son to die for us, and the fact that we have to center our entire existence on the power of the gospel, not only as individuals, but as a church. And I pray that you open our heart and mind to the knowledge of these things. And as our knowledge increases, pray that our faith increases too. We love you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So let's dive into the book of Romans. I love this book. When I did my master's degree, I took the book of Romans. And just to, again, to tell you the, the, the depth of the material that exists there, uh, in my Romans class, it met for one week. The reason for that is it was an online class, but we met in person for one week, Monday to Friday. And the class met in the classroom from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. with an hour and a half break for lunch. So Ideally, we were going to be studying all 16 chapters, but as we got into it, we realized the depth of material, and just to let you know how deep it is, in attending that week-long class from 8 to 5 for five straight days, at the end of day 5, we got to the end of chapter 6. So there is a, there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's beautiful, and the beautiful thing is, is we don't really have a timetable. For, for this. You know, Lord willing, we've got as much time as we need. So that's why we break this down into bite-sized chunks, because no doubt there will be things that are challenging here. There will be things that um, will stretch us, and, and and I think that's a good thing, you know. Uh, sometimes when it comes to a Bible study, you're taught what to think and not how to think, and while that has to exist in some forms, um, it has to, ex you have to know what to think in terms of these doctrinal things. When we talk about doctrine, we are talking about things that we firmly believe and these things do not change. We do learn how to think in that regard, but in terms of other things, we have to know, um, or we're taught what to think in those regards, but we need to know how to think, right? How do we study scripture? And, and that's another element here too. So let's talk about the book of Romans. The book of Romans is an epistle. And an epistle, very simply, is a letter written to a church, right? And this is written by the Apostle Paul, all right? Let's talk a little bit about Paul's background first. So remember that Paul started his life as a guy named Saul of Tarsus, right? He's from Tarsus. That's a Roman colony. So <coughs> that tells us that Paul... It's not only Jewish, but he's a Roman citizen. And that's pretty key given some of the detail that he's going to work into this letter. And if you look at Paul's overall life, his Roman citizenship is something uh, that is that needs to be taken into consideration. But Saul was an up-and-coming Pharisee. Remember, Pharisee is a Jewish religious leader, and there are really two kinds of Jewish religious leaders. You've got Pharisees and Sadducees, and while they are Jewish religious leaders, they have a differing theology, right? Uh, Sadducees deny the resurrection, right? That They say there is no resurrection of the dead. So I say that to say that later on, you do see Pharisees who do hold to a resurrection. You do see Pharisees becoming Christians later. Right? You really don't see Sadducees becoming Christians because they deny the resurrection, and to, the, to deny a resurrection is to not become a Christian, right? because the resurrection is everything, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But Paul is an up-and-coming Pharisee, and he's not just an up-and-comer. He's like the first-round draft pick of Pharisees. Right? He is brilliant. His Jewish roots were thick. I mean, you can read uh, like Philippians chapter 3 to get Paul's lineage. Uh, but he uh, has thick Jewish roots. And to be honest with you, he was very skeptical of this up-and-coming Jesus movement. Right? He was devout to the Old Testament law. He was devout to uh, the oral tradition of the Pharisees because the Pharisees didn't just live based on um, the Old Testament law. They lived on their own oral tradition, and that got them into a lot of trouble. And uh, Saul was very, very devout to those things. Right? He was devout to the Old Testament. He was devout to the oral tradition. And so that made him very, very skeptical uh, of this new Jesus movement to the point he wanted to stomp them out. He wanted them to uh, be dealt with. He wanted them to go away. He wanted to crush them. And so he made it his mission, and he thought he was on a mission from God at that point. Later on, he would realize that he was actually fighting against God. But at, at the 
time of of him coming onto the scene, right, like the end of Acts chapter 8, um, when we first start hearing about him, uh, he was zealous to eliminate the church, right? When Stephen, the first Christian martyr, is killed, um, he held the coats of the men that stoned Stephen to death. It says, and Saul approved of their killing. Like, he was going into these Christians' homes and dragging them out into the street. He was sending them to be uh, executed or tortured or uh, sold as slaves, put in prison, whatever he could do to break their spirits. And later on, uh, the persecution that Saul was levying out got so bad that the Christians in Jerusalem started to scatter away. And that makes complete sense. If someone is trying to kill you, you're probably going to move somewhere else. And Saul, because he's very, very smart, right? he uh, thought, well, what is keeping me from going to these other areas where the Christians are. Nobody had, nobody said I had to stay uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, so he thought, why can't I go to these other places? So Jerusalem was the epicenter of the church, but once the persecution broke out, Damascus, right, in Syria, really became a, a Christian hotbed. So a lot of Christians were moving from Jerusalem to Damascus. So Paul thinks, well, why, what's keeping me from going to Damascus? And so he gets letters from the... Uh, from the synagogue, or he gets letters to the synagogues in Damascus. Those letters are not necessarily warrants. Uh, they're extradition papers, right? So Paul legally is able to go to uh, Damascus and extradite these Christians back to Jerusalem to do with them as he sees fit. So he takes a band of men, because Saul's certainly not doing this by himself. He's the leader of this outfit. He's not uh, necessarily... Um, dragging these people out of their homes himself. He's got men that are doing this. And on the way to Jeru on the way to Damascus from Jerusalem in Acts chapter 9, uh, Saul is knocked off his horse by a blinding white light. And a voice comes from the light and it says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul asks a very legitimate question. Well, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, He's talking about Damascus, go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The man who was trying to eliminate Christians has just been called into service by Jesus, right? He has just, you know, the man that was trying to eliminate Christians ends up becoming one. And, and it's a beautiful thing. So Saul ends up becoming baptized, becomes a Christian. And not only that, Saul is commissioned by God to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Remember, a Gentile is anybody that's not a Jew, right? Anyone that's not a Jew is a Gentile. So uh, Saul is the one that's going to take the gospel to them, but he's not only had an identity change in that now he's no longer defined by the evilness of his past, now he's defined by his relationship with Christ. So because he's a new creation, he's going to uh, no longer go by his Jewish name, Saul, and instead go by his Roman name, Paul, because remember, he's a Roman citizen. So he starts going by Paul, and he starts going all throughout the wider Roman world, proclaiming the good news of Christ and organizing these new Christian converts into communities of faith called churches. Right? And from time to time, Paul is going to write letters to those churches. Those are called epistles. And he writes to them for different reasons. Sometimes it's to help them foster their faith. Sometimes it's to answer their questions. Sometimes it's to correct their manner of thinking. Well, we really see that a lot in 1 uh, Corinthians. And the letter to the Romans here is absolutely no different. Right? Um, it is a letter written to a specific church. Here's the really unique thing about this. This letter is written to a church Paul had never been to and written to a group of people he had never met. So this is really fascinating. You have to think, if you're in Paul's position and you're going to write a letter to a church, what do you say to a church that you've never met? What do you say to a group of people who, who've never met you before? Now, no doubt these Christians in Rome, they definitely know who Paul is, but he's never actually met them. Thing is, the Roman church was dealing with a very serious situation. So the, the question is, what do you write to a church who you don't really know and who you do know is facing a crisis? What do you even say? So let's talk about the, the nature of that, right? What do you say to a church that's, that's really dealing with some difficulties? <clears throat> so the church in Rome had existed for quite some time. Okay, you can read Acts chapter 18, the first two verses to, to get that information. 
It had existed for quite some time, and it was made up of both Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus, so Jewish and Gentile Christians. At a certain point in history, the Roman emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome. Essentially, Claudius says, if you're Jewish, you've got to leave Rome. You don't got to go home, but you can't stay here. Everybody out. Five years after that, Claudius had died, and the Jews, including Jesus-following Jews, were allowed to return to Rome. Well, when these Jesus-following Jews returned to Rome, they found a church that had become very non-Jewish in custom and practice. And so that actually created so much tension between Jewish and non-Jewish Christians in the Roman church that um, by Paul's day, the church had actually split, right? It, it was divided, they were arguing over everything. They were arguing about how to follow Jesus. They were arguing over whether non-Jewish Christians had to keep the Sabbath. Did non-Jewish Christians need to be circumcised? Did non-Jewish Christians need to eat kosher? And so Paul writes this letter for several reasons. First thing is he's wanting to unite the people, right? He's wanting to unite this church. This church should not be split, right? They were focusing so much on their differences. There, there was no real community there. Right? And that still happens, by the way. Churches focus a lot more on their differences than the one major thing that unites them. So Paul writes them this to, A, encourage them to remain united. But there's a reason for that. He's not just talking about unity in and of itself. I mean, that's important. There's a reason. Paul is wanting to go west with the message of the gospel. He's pretty well covered a lot of the middle of the Mediterranean world and the eastern portions, but he's wanting to go west specifically. He's wanting to go all the way to Spain. And he's hoping that the Roman church will be his kind of jumping off point to take the gospel west all the way to Spain. And that can't really happen if they are all over the place and divided and things like that. So he wants them to be united so that they can be his jumping off point to take the mission or take the message of Christ all the way to Spain. Secondly, though, he is going to give his fullest explanation of the gospel. Now, remember, the gospel is the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for us and the victory that he's won. So in explaining the gospel, Paul is going to explain Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection and their incredible importance. The gospel is the thing that unites the church, right? It must be the foundation for everything we are, not only as individuals, but it must be the foundation of who we are as a church, right? Churches live and die based on how connected they are to the gospel. I remember when I became senior pastor of Highland Christian Church, we had our first vision casting meeting. And uh, praise God, we're headed into our fourth vision casting meeting later this week to talk about where we're headed into 2022. But I remember the first thing that uh, we talked about was being centered on the gospel. I remember getting up to give my presentation and I talked for like eight minutes because essentially my point was, here's the vision for, at that point, uh, 2019. Here is our vision. We are going to be centered on the gospel because it's everything that we are, right? It unites us, right? Without the gospel, we are absolutely nothing. I'll give you an example. Um, in southeast, southwest Louisiana, there is a river called the Atchafalaya River, which, by the way, is a really fun word to say. And the Atchafalaya River exists because of the overflow of the Mississippi River, right? The, the larger Mississippi. So the, if the Mississippi is up, the Atchafalaya is up. If the Mississippi is down, the Atchafalaya is down. Point is, the Atchafalaya lives and dies based on its connection to the Mississippi. I want you to think of the church having that kind of relationship with the gospel. If the Atchafalaya were to disconnect from the Mississippi, it would no longer cease to exist. Likewise, if the church were to disconnect from the message of the gospel, it would no longer exist, right? We live and die based on our connection to the gospel. Do you know what you call a church who has disconnected from the gospel? You call it a building for sale because they have died. The gospel is everything. So the reason that Paul gives his fullest explanation is because that's what's going to unite them. It not only gives us new life, it unites the church. It's got to be fully understood. And so we're going to get Paul's fullest explanation of the gospel as we walk through these pages, right? And in order to do that, you first have got to talk about the wickedness of humanity before you talk about 
right? God's incredible righteousness, right? You've got to talk about how sinful the human heart is because if you don't talk about that first, then grace isn't going to mean anything. And for the first seven or so chapters, Paul is going to talk about how sinful humans are. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to ask you, please stick with this study, right? Because the first seven chapters are going to be a little bit rough, but you've got to know how deceitful the human heart is so that you know how incredible God sending his son to die in our place really is. Right, so Paul's got to talk about some things that are rough. I won't even sugarcoat it for you. Some of this stuff is not going to be fun to read, but it's important. He has to open talking about these things. Any gospel conversation has got to begin talking about sin. Because again, if you don't talk about that, then um, grace is really not going to mean anything to you. So here we're getting Paul's fullest explanation of the gospel. Let's talk about how this is broken down. I wrote this out for you here. Now, my writing is pretty bad, so I will uh, translate here for you here. <clears throat> so if we're talking about the, um, the way that it's broken down, let's, it's broken down into really four parts, but all of these sections are united by that mission to explain the gospel fully. So even though it's broken down, all of these things are united in the gospel. So you'll notice every section begins with the gospel. So chapters one through four, the gospel reveals God's righteousness. So that's really what we're going to be talking about for the first four chapters, the gospel revealing God's righteousness. Second thing, the gospel creates new humanity. Right, the gospel creates new humanity. Second thing, the gospel fulfills God's promise to Israel. Right, more on that in just a little bit. And in chapters 12 to 16, the gospel unifies the church. So this is the way that Paul breaks it down. And as he does, he is giving his absolute fullest explanation. This is Paul's longest book, and it's written pretty late in his career, right? Way later. So Paul's theology is really developed by this point. He's a very mature Christian at this point. So because it's written a lot later, we get a lot of really, really good detail. So let's jump in here to the introduction to Paul's letter. Okay, we will look at some other things as we move forward, but let's talk about the introductory part here. Uh, this is something in Pauline letters called a prescript. Okay, we would just call it an introduction, but in terms of ancient letters, it's called a prescript. And generally speaking, Paul follows the traditional Greek style of writing. And the traditional Greek introduction to a letter is very, very simple. It, it, it really looks like this. Blank to blank greetings. That's literally how this goes down, right? Typically, any ancient writing, like let's say I was going to write a letter to my wife, right? So it, I would, if I were following the ancient Greek model, I would say, Justin to Sarah, greetings. That, that's, the, that's the standard way to go about writing this, okay? Paul, however, is going to follow that model to an extent, but he's going to make it a, a little bit more complex, Right, His introductions are complex, and his introduction to the Romans is his lengthiest, right? Because A, he's going to explain the full gospel, and B, he's going to talk about his credentials, right? So let's begin here. With, with that in mind, let's look at Paul's introduction, right? Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, let's just take verse one right there. Paul, a servant. That's really a watered down word in that, in that translation, right? I'm using the ESV, and by and large, the English Standard Version is a pretty literal translation. Um, but with that said, a servant of Christ Jesus is not the best word there. Literally, the Greek, because this was written in Greek, Greek's the world language at the time, Literally, it's a slave of Christ Jesus. So Paul has just called himself a slave. He's not complaining, right? He's actually uh, wearing that title as a badge of honor. Right? That's what he's doing. So he's saying, Paul, a slave, I, I believe very literally it's bond servant, but that would, that would mean slave, a slave of Christ Jesus. When he's talking about these things, he's actually hearkening back to the slavery that existed in the wider Roman world. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but in the Roman population, 85 to 90% of the population 
was either slaves or people of foreign birth. So slavery was something that absolutely existed in the wider Roman world. And in this moment, Paul is actually hearkening back to the slavery that existed in the Old Testament. Does slavery exist in the Bible? Yes. Yes, it does. But it is not in any way the same thing as what would happen like in the American South right, in the 18th, 19th century, or what would happen in Europe, right, during the same time. It's very, very different. So in the Old Testament, you do see slavery existing. However, slaves in the Old Testament, uh, specifically Hebrew slaves, could only serve for six years. They had to be released on the seventh, and they had to receive some kind of pay, right? Whatever they helped to develop in that six-year period, they got a portion of it. And they were released after, you know, after seven years. So it's very different from what would become the modern notion of slavery. But here's the thing. To call yourself a slave of God or to call yourself a slave of Christ Jesus was actually a compliment. In the Old Testament, uh, you see lots of very prominent Old Testament figures calling themselves slaves of God. Uh, Abraham does. Moses does. Uh, I believe... Um, David does, Elijah does. And they do that because they're talking about their dedication to God, right? You think about it, slaves are very dedicated to their masters because they have to be, right? Same thing for followers of God, right? We are slaves of God. We are unbelievably dedicated to him, right? We are dedicated to God. But Paul is not, and so it was not uncommon for people in the Old Testament to willingly call themselves a slave of God, yeah, I'm a slave of God. Paul calls himself a slave of Christ Jesus. Why? Because of the victory Christ has won, he is now Lord and God. And so he's calling, he, he's uh, talking about his dedication and obedience to the Lord God, right? To Jesus Christ. Now you'll notice it says, it says Christ Jesus. So Christ is not a, is not a name, right? And just to clear things up, Jesus Christ, that's not his last name, right? Christ is a title, right? It means anointed one. So just so we, just so that we're on the same page, Messiah and Christ mean the same thing. So when we say Jesus Christ or when we say Jesus Messiah, it means the same thing. Messiah and Christ mean chosen one or anointed one. The difference is Christ is Greek, Messiah is Hebrew, Okay, so Paul, in saying, I'm a slave, I am dedicated, unbelievably dedicated to Christ Jesus, he states that messianic title first, right? Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, I am a servant of Christ Jesus. But not only that, he's wearing it as a badge of honor because of his dedication, but he's also wearing it as a badge of honor because he knows there is reward in that, right? There's an incredible amount of, of reward, Um. Roman slaves were actually protected and in some instances paid by their owners, right? Roman slaves were considered to be members of their owner's extended family, right? And actually, Roman slaves had a better social standing when they were slaves than they did once they were freed, right? So to be a slave was actually a, a, a gave you status, right? It sounds so upside down, but in the Roman culture, it gave you status, right? You belong to something, Right, So Paul's saying, I am a slave of Christ Jesus. I'm dedicated to him. I am obedient to him. I'm doing exactly what he tells me to do. And I know that that means I belong to him. Right? I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a slave of Christ. We could learn so much by bragging that we're slaves of the Lord Jesus. Right? We are dedicated to him. It's a badge of honor that we are grafted into his family. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so if you've ever thought to look down upon the fact that some people brag about being slaves of God, it's a badge of honor. Do not think it poorly. It's, an, it's a beautiful, beautiful way to think and to um, brag, if you will. I, I, don't, I don't mean to use the word brag, but um, it's not boasting of ourselves. It's, it's boasting about Christ and the way that he came to die for us so that we could be dedicated to him, so that we could be obedient to him, so that we could have a relationship with him. That's the first thing he brings up. A servant of Christ Jesus called to be an apostle. Now, you see apostle, the word apostle, used quite a bit all throughout the New Testament, but we never really take time to describe what an apostle is. So, an apostle is someone um, who is a representative of the church as a whole, right? I don't mean a church. I mean the capital C overall church, right? Uh, an apostle is a church representative or a missionary, 
right? So Paul, in calling himself an apostle, is saying he's a representative of the church and he's a missionary, and he is saying that he has been chosen by God to found other agents and leaders of the church. So apostles are not only church representatives and missionaries, they create other church leaders. How, with that being said, though, um, there were specific qualifications for those who were going to be apostles. You had to have been with the Lord Jesus, and you had to have seen the risen Lord Jesus, right? Those are the qualifications. So how many apostles are there? Well, there are numerous ones listed. First off, you've got the 12 original disciples who would eventually, or I should say the 11 original disciples, who would eventually become the, an apostle. Judas is out of that, right? Because while Judas was with the Lord Jesus, he would take his own life before getting to see the risen Jesus. Also, he's the great betrayer, so he's not an apostle. Um, but the man that replaces Judas, Matthias, would be, because he would have seen, he would have been around Jesus, he would have seen the risen Jesus. Um, Paul is an apostle. You say, well, well, wait a minute, how could he have seen the risen Jesus? Remember what happened on Paul's journey, right, to Damascus? Um, he, the, the risen Jesus, in, in the form of a blinding light, literally knocks Saul off his horse. So he has seen the risen Jesus. And then God calls Paul to be his envoy to the Gentiles, right? Paul, you're going to go and you're going to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish people, because Jesus died not only for the people of Israel, but for all people. Everyone's received the same amount of grace, right? So you're going to be my envoy, if you will, to the Gentiles. Well, then who was speaking the gospel to the Jews? Primarily Peter, Right Now, Peter will eventually go and speak to the Gentiles too, but as in terms of when the church is starting, Peter is kind of preaching the gospel to the Jews, whereas Paul is going to um, preach it to the Gentiles, right? So we see the word apostle there. Paul is introducing himself here, talking about his credentials, and he's going to explain kind of the essence of the gospel just here in his introduction. Verse 2. Set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So what Paul is going to get at here is um, Jesus' preexistence and his earthly existence, right? Because one thing that we have to look at here is the notion that the gospel has been provided beforehand, right? The gospel has been provided beforehand. It's not something that just existed in the New Testament, right? The gospel, right, that Christ would win victory over evil and bring us back to God has existed from the very beginning, right? Let's go look at Genesis chapter 3. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Remember, in Genesis 3, you have the fall of man, right? Humanity falls into sin. And at that moment, the relationship or that deeply communal relationship between God and humanity is fractured, right? But now... Uh, from that very moment, God instituted the message of the gospel. Check this out. Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. God is speaking. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He's talking to Satan. Uh, he shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. Who's the he? Well, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is eventually going to come and crush the head of the serpent. That's fatal. But it's not going to come without some pain. Jesus will get his heel struck. He will go through unbelievable pain to bring about this victory. But ultimately, the pain that Jesus feels will bring victory over, um, over Satan, right? right? The, the, having someone, someone having their head crushed is fatal, right? You, you can't come back from that. So in the victory that Christ won, Satan is forever defeated, right? He's forever destroyed. From the very beginning was the plan to bring us back to God. So the gospel has existed. That plan existed beforehand, meaning before this moment, right? Before the moment here in Romans chapter one, the gospel existed, right? The Before um, Jesus came to earth, right? The gospel existed. But it's talking about Christ's preexistence. Christ has always existed, right? 
He has always existed. God has never not existed in the three persons of the Trinity. Right, you've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They ha- he, God has always existed in the three persons of the Trinity. It's not as if Jesus the Son became part of the Trinity when he was born. No, he's always been that way, right? It's always been that three persons but one God. How do we know that Jesus has existed since the beginning? Well, let's check out John chapter 1. The Gospel of John chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. If you need a second, uh, you can pause the video and get there. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word. Note that the Word is capitalized. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God. He was in the beginning with God. If we are going to talk about the Gospel of John for a second, the Gospel is a biography of Jesus. Notice it says, in the beginning was the Word. Word is capitalized. That is the Greek word logos, right, which means word, but it also means plan. Notice it says, he was with God in the beginning. We're talking about Jesus, right? Jesus has always existed, right? He's always existed with God. The Holy Spirit has always existed with God. God the Father has always existed in and of himself. Three persons, but one God. He's talking about his pre-existence. How do we know that? Look at Romans 1, beginning in verse 3. Um, concerning his son who was descended, meaning he existed beforehand. Right? He existed before. Um, and then it's now talking about his earthly existence. Who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we've talked about his pre-existence. We've also to, are, need to talk about his earthly presence. Jesus is fully God and fully man. He's 100% God. He's 100% human. The difference there is he never sinned. He exists in perfection, right? He's 100% man, 100% God. Right, So he's got to come from human family line too, and we know that he comes from the family line of David. Okay, So we're, st- we're talking about the same David here. right? David uh, that slayed Goliath would become second king of Israel. Um, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promises that David will have a descendant on the throne forever. Let's go to um, 2 Samuel chapter 7. <clears throat> 2 Samuel 7, let me give you the context here. In 2 Samuel 7, David wants to build God a house, wants to build God an elaborate palace, right? He feels bad. He's living in a palace, but the Ark of the Covenant of God is in a tent in the desert. That's not right. Something needs to change there. So um, David wants to build God this immaculate palace house and he starts getting all of these plans and God tells David, uh, listen, you're not the one that's going to build me a house. But I've got other plans for you. Check out this. 2 Samuel 7, beginning in verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan, who was a prophet, spoke to David. So we know that Jesus was promised to come and win victory from Genesis chapter 315. But from that point, um, all of the different prophets foretold Jesus coming as Messiah from the family line of David. Not just Nathan the prophet, but prophets like Moses, major and minor prophets like you see at the end of the Old Testament, right? So here in Romans 1, he's talking about his pre-existence and his earthly existence. Jesus has always existed, and he's come from the family line of David. He's fully God and fully man. He is the Messiah. He has won the victory, and this because of the victory he's won, we now have this message to give, right? Now, here's something else, too. Check this out was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of Holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's the thing. There is a mismatched theology, right, 
called adoptionship or adoptionist theology. And that means that some people think Jesus did not become the son of God until his resurrection. They think of that based on this verse right here. Okay, because look at it. A very literal reading says this. Declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Some people have now grafted their theology into thinking that Jesus was not the son of God until he resurrected from the dead. That's a very much too literal reading of this, and it's, it's not true. Jesus has always been son of God, right? He was with God in the beginning, right? His sonship was the foundation for his entire existence here on earth, right, being son of God. But we know that he was son of God the whole time, but well before his resurrection, right? Let's go to Mark chapter 1. The gospel of Mark chapter 1 Verse 11, this is Jesus being baptized. Jesus' baptism was an example to us all that we are to be baptized. So check this out. The Gospel of Mark chapter 1, verse 11. After Jesus is baptized, this happens. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So he's already, right, designated as the son of God, right? He's already the son of God. But there's, he's the son of God in two different ways. Before the resurrection, he's the son of God in humility, right? After his resurrection, he's the son of God in power because he's won the victory. That's what it means there. Uh, was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So he's always been the son of God, but before that, he was son of God in I don't want to use the word weakness, but in, in humility, right, lowliness. And after the resurrection, he's the son of God in power because he's won the decisive victory, right? So do not think he just became son of God after the resurrection. He was at the whole time, but he's son of God in power after he, he won that victory, right? Let's keep going. Look at verse 5. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Christ Jesus. We're talking about the nature of um, apostleship, right? For obedience to faith. Paul is giving the purpose of an apostle, right? The purpose of the apostle's work was to persuade people to obey God's command and to trust him, right? Give their lives to him. Right, that's what he says here. Bring about obedience to faith for the sake of his name among the nations. That's the job of the apostle, right? Because of the victory of Christ, we now have an obligation, right? He's talking about apostles. We have the obligation to persuade people to obey God and to trust him. This includes you, Romans, is what he's saying in verse six. This includes you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Then he browns it out in verse seven. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he introduces this letter. There's a lot in just saying hello when it comes to Paul, right? So you can see how we're going to break this down as we move forward. Paul has introduced himself. He's talked about the nature of the gospel and he has described his qualifications. He's going to then further explain the gospel as we move forward. Now, if you have any questions about anything that we've talked about, make sure that you send me an email. It's in the description. That study guide that will, in detail, talk about everything we just talked about is in the link in this description as well. You can do with that as you see fit. If you have prayer requests, send those to me too. Don't forget there's a congregational meeting after both services this week to vote on elders and deacons and the 2022 budget. Thank you guys uh, for watching. I'm excited for where this is going. Uh, let's pray and then we'll be finished. Father, we love you. We praise you and thank you for all that you do. We are so thankful uh, for your gospel. I pray that you help us to see the entire Bible as representing the gospel and not just the New Testament. Father, I pray that you continue to use this group to strengthen our knowledge of you. We pray over any prayer requests that are on our hearts. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. Have a great week.